I love white wine. I love red wine. Mm -hmm. Any type of wine is good with any type of picnic. I like beer. You like... Welcome to Intoxicated Masculinity, where we talk about pop culture, drinking culture, politics, and anything else that comes up. As always, joining me today is Brandon. Hello, my people. And Kale. Hello. And uh, today we're going to do something a little bit different. I am going to kind of hand the reins of, uh, of uh, moderation over to Kale. Uh, we talk a lot about drinking, and one thing we like to do when we're drinking often is eating. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about cooking with alcohol. But first, let's see what we're all drinking tonight. Kale, what are you having tonight? I am having Sailor Jerry's with root beer. A fine cocktail indeed. Brandon, what are you having this evening? I made my own, sticking to the rule of having three things in a cocktail. I put rum, cokey, chinar, and sweet vermouth together, and it's not bad. Fair enough. And I am having a Diet Coke. Are you lying? No, I'm actually having a Diet Coke. I, I'm not well, somebody, I don't drink soda basically ever. Uh, but every so often I do, I do love the taste of Coke. I think it's, it's, a, it's a bracing flavor. And so I decided to have a Diet Coke tonight. Now, We've got our drinks out of the way. Let's talk about eating. So, Kale, what do you have to say about drinking? Or, uh, <laughs> well, you probably have things to say about drinking also. What do you have to say about cooking with alcohol? I think it's something that people should probably get in the practice of because it adds characteristics and flavors to your food that you probably never thought of before. Um, and I have a few uh, recipes here that I'm going to mention. And I have links for all of them, so they will be uh, accessible to anyone watching the video. And so I think that people should do more cooking in general, honestly. Uh, as you can see, I'm in my chef's whites. But I want to clarify, I am not a chef. I have not officially earned that title. That title is hard earned with blood, burns, sweat anxiety attacks and screaming in the walk-in cooler so and uh yeah it's it's a high pressure high stress field to be in and i do have a passion for cooking and i i want to spread that passion to other other people and because i think cooking is great it's a great way to release your creativity and to just try new things a little adventure I think uh, uh, maybe talk about uh, some of the chefs that we are familiar with and, and chefs that we like. Um, I know I've read uh, Anthony Bourdain's books, you know, RIP to him. They lost him way too soon. Um, and his books, if you're interested in cooking, have some really fantastic stuff. He talks a lot about cooking and like culture and drinking and, and a lot of stuff like that. So Anthony Bourdain's a great person to, uh, to read up on. Yes, I'm going to uh, mention that here in a while. Uh, but just to uh, get right off the, uh, the gate here, uh, I didn't want to say, uh, let's start out with something simple. Now, uh, there is a uh, soup that most people have probably seen. Uh, it's called French onion soup. And French onion soup was created during the French Revolution. Well, thereabouts, a little after. Um, and the reason for that is French onion soup was created because all the people who were chefs or, or the, of the cooking class in France worked for rich people, mostly royalty. And during the French Revolution, they were forced out into the countryside, so they didn't have access to those same ingredients. Rich people can afford spices from halfway around the world. Rich people can afford the highest quality products and produce and meats and whatnot. Poor people can't afford that. So you're talking during the French Revolution, you have to work with what you can find. 
French onion soup is an excellent example of that. Uh, you take simple ingredients, uh, fresh onion, garlic butter, some beef stock, a little salt and pepper, and some vermouth. Gotta have some vermouth. However, there is a more traditional recipe that does call for some white wine, a couple other things that'll be included in the link. Um, but I like the more simplified version of it. It's easy to handle. Anybody can basically do it. Uh, it's just really delicious. And I've even gone so far personally myself to make some French onion soup based onions with these ingredients uh, sauteed in a cast iron skillet to make a French onion roast beef grilled cheese, which I wish I still had pictures of, but um, it was quite delicious. Does that interest either of you? I mean, you, you're talking about cheese and uh, beef stock. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board for pretty much all of that. I admit I'm not much of an onion person texture wise. Like it's got to be pretty chopped up or cut down for me. But that does sound pretty good. I would just like would to clarify, wife- clarify for the rest of the world that Brandon is wrong about onions. Onions are fantastic. Um, and I find everything he's saying right now to be abhorrent to flavor in general. Yeah, if it has garlic or onions in it, I probably like it. Oh, I'll go for garlic. And I don't mind the onion flavor. It's just the texture itself. It's I think I think it's kind of interesting thing you talk about. And, and it's, it's sort of interesting. All the delicacies that we have um, now uh, probably at one point or another came from people that were somewhere starving to death and were like, yeah, I guess we can eat snails. Would you because say if we white... don't, we're going to starve to death and that's better than starving to death. Was the white one the more upper crust one? Necessity is the mother of invention. So. Uh, before we get too far into this, though, I want to cover... Yeah, I, he, Brandon was asking a question. He was saying, asking, oh. is the, the white wine a more like upper crusty version of the French onion soup, or or is that is that a thing? Um, it's more traditional. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, but like if you're using a white wine vinegar or a vermouth, a dry vermouth, it's all based out of that white wine family. Um And that's a good segue question because that leads right into what I was going to talk about next, which was you have to consider a few basics. Uh, When you're doing a cream sauce or butter sauce or something like that, you're going to use something in the white wine family. Um, Now, there are a lot of recipes that call for red wine. And in the red wine, you're not only considering uh, your, your flavor profile, but you're also considering your colors because red wine is highly uh, capable of changing the color of a dish. So you could make a red wine gravy sauce or you could make like a red wine risotto. And it's gonna give you that nice velvety red color. Now, if you don't want that, stay away from red wine. Um, I didn't come across any recipes today that uh, fell into the sweet vermouth category. But if there were, that would also be the same effect. You'd get a lot of red um, in that. A couple of basics. Though, uh, when you are cooking with alcohol, you want to keep your, and you're going to be mostly in sauces. It's going to be mostly in sauces. Unless you're braising something or uh, using it to clear up a pan, you're going to just be simmering. You want to simmer your sauces. Um, you want to, and you really want to get your sauce to where it starts to thicken before you add your alcohol product. Some recipes, you know, I suggest if you're following a recipe, uh, one that we share here or one that you find somewhere, follow the recipe. But general rule, uh, when you're making a sauce, you want to thicken the sauce, then add your alcohol when it starts to thicken, so that alcohol has a chance to evaporate. You get to extract some of those characteristics and your sauce will come out evenly. And, One thing, uh, uh, I, I have sort of limited experience with sauces. I'll make a, I'll make an Alfredo sauce here and there. And the one thing that I found is uh, the easiest mistake to make when you're making your Alfredo sauce is to have your sauce too hot when you put your cheese in because it can curdle the cheese. 
And it actually yes. isn't, it doesn't necessarily hurt the flavor of the sauce, particularly because I think it still tasted okay. But you do have a weird kind of gloopy sauce if you, if you put it on too high. Cheese and dairy, uh, any dairy products, cream, milk, anything like that. Uh, follow the same rules you would with um, smoking or barbecue. Slow and low, slow and low. Let it do its job. Don't force it. Because if you try to force it, you know, it's just not going to work out right. You're, if you're using the wrong tools, you're not going to get the job done. Another also nice thing when you're, when you're cooking with wine is if you have any excess portion of the wine, that portion can be poured into a glass and consumed, which is something well, that's, you know, good for everyone. I feel like that's going without saying that <laughs> you're going to, you know, as, as someone who's cooking something, you're not just going to use your audience as guinea pigs. You're not just going to throw something together and be like, there, eat this. You have to try it. And part of trying that is making sure you try the ingredients that you put in it. Just like when you're doing a cocktail, you want to know what those things do before you put them together. Um, Sometimes you have to try the ingredients fairly voluminously before you get, get going. That I do have a foreshadowing here. Uh, I was inspired by your solo cocktail videos and I am coming up with a cocktail of a local ingredient here that I really, really doubt anybody has thought of before. But, uh, well, I'm going to guess 99% of people have never thought of trying this before. And I'm going to try it and I'm going to hopefully share it with you on the cocktail video side of this. We um, look forward to always trying new cocktails. One other thing, uh, when cooking with alcohol, uh, your wines and uh, vermouths and things like that, they're obviously thin. They have a really light viscosity. Um, when you're using something more like a liqueur, um, it's going to be much thicker. And when you're cooking something, you're taking hydration out of it. So it's going to make it thicker. So your liquor cooking time is going to be much less than something that has a lower viscosity. I've noticed the more I cook, the thicker I get. Well, that, that goes with the territory. Um, couple other um, recipes here. Well, since we brought up the, uh, the uh, red wine category, um, there is uh, one I came across today, which is kind of a spin because I, originally thought the first one of the first things that popped in my mind was beef bourguignon or uh burgundy beef as most people would probably call it now that is done in a slow cooker uh typically but uh there, that sounds I came, pretty bougie i thought i came across one <laughs> crock pot red wine braised short ribs i read through the recipe, recipe and it sounds amazing so I think I want to try this, and I hope other people try this too. Like I said, there'll be a link to the recipe. Cock, crock, <laughs> crock pot red wine braised short ribs, and um, it is it just sounds amazing. Uh, red wine, obviously, short ribs. I, I like ribs. You say ribs, you got me, bro. <laughs> what about you guys? Oh, I I love ribs. Ribs are fantastic. Yeah, yeah ribs. Um, are I actually I grilled ribs out for that we. Uh, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not, but uh, my wife and I went in with some friends and we bought uh, half a hog. And so we got the ribs out of it and I cooked those on the grill the other day and slow and low is like it was ribs. Slow and low is the key. You know, um, if you have a convection oven, you can actually make them a little bit faster uh, just because of the way convection ovens work. That's but true. if you're doing them at home, if you're doing them in the oven, you know, set your oven about as low as it'll go, put them in there and just let them sit, check them every hour or so, you know, I mean, you can you can spend two three hours. A convection. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna I was just gonna interject there. The convection oven. The way it works is they use blower fans to keep the heat even throughout the entire uh, cavity of the oven, and plus yeah. it speeds it up because it's forced air. And yeah, with, with ribs, you you can definitely take your time on them. Get a good rub, and like for me, I love a lot of brown sugar, uh, like a brown sugar rub. Uh, that'll come off just it's it it it, it uh, caramelizes in the in the uh, oven and it just it's delicious when it comes up and then uh, my favorite using... sauce is gates gates hot barbecue sauce that's what i use but 
but you are welcome to uh, to shop around. I love Gates. Swear on Gates. Um, anytime you're doing a smoker, though, yeah, your rub, that's everything. I'm sorry. that The sauce is an afterthought. The rub is everything on smoking. And you always, any of the best uh, smokers are going to tell you to use an offset heat box. I know the stack is very convenient. The electric ones are super convenient. I have one, but I like my old offset heat box smoker. Now, if I was really into spending the money on it, which one day, maybe, <laughs> I would actually build a physical smokehouse, uh, brick, cedar, galvanized steel, the whole works, rotisserie, um, and then I'm even talking about a uh, pump to run the drippings back up. <laughs> I like all those words. <laughs> <laughs> drippings. <laughs> the, so out of curiosity, do you have, um, you know, you mentioned Bourdain. Do you have a favorite chef currently living? Somebody that inspires your recipes and you still learn from? Um, I really got out of the media side of it because in reality, like when I went through culinary school, which I will be the first to admit, and then I want to clarify this, that I am not a chef by any means at all. I had never earned the title. Um, I had like a year left to go and, 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 and I really enjoyed the school well, to, just to i, really, um, I, I want to interject just briefly kel's underselling himself a little bit he's worked in approximately 500 different restaurants um and so he he definitely knows his way around the kitchen i think he's he's underselling himself a little bit yeah he didn't he didn't stop culinary school because of the culinary part of it i mean i don't no, get me wrong i i, I love to make fun of kale at any opportunity possible but in this case he, he knows what he's talking about he can whip up a meal. Because I'm fat. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, like I, I, I aced all the cooking labs. It was great. In the cooking labs, it was the book work. I'm not a good student. I'm not a good student. But if you are a good student and you have a passion for cooking, I suggest going to ICI. Not that I'm plugging them. I'm just saying it's a good school because they've had graduates that go on to Brown. They, they go on out to New York to the culinary Institute there and make something of themselves. And that's honestly, that's where Bourdain went in New York and Bourdain uh, speaking of the media side of it was one of my culinary heroes, not because of his ability to cook because in most of the shows you don't actually see him cooking. It was just his passion for the food. Like he made me want it so bad. He wait, he just, you know, there's that, that hunger of the travel and meeting new people and trying all these new foods and trying to make these new foods and trying to do these things, the experience. And I think that cooking should be an experience. I'd maybe skip the um, rotting shark before in get, Iceland though. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, before I get too far in, off the deep end here, um, a couple of simpler recipes. Uh, penne alla vodka. There's not much to that one. Um, and it's pretty easy for a lot of people to do. Uh, obviously, you have to have vodka. <laughs> uh, that is a another dish that includes an alcohol base. Um, Brandon, you'll like this one. Bourbon bagel bread pudding. Does nice. that have your attention, Brandon? That sounds pretty good. I like all those words too. I know you're a bread pudding fan. I am not a huge bread pudding person, but you put bourbon in front of bagel bread pudding and you got my attention. <laughs> Doesn't, um, uh, on the on the previous one, isn't uh, vodka have like some sort of, uh, I don't know, working class proletarian history to it too? Well, vodka is kind of a weird does. vodka is kind of a weird duck um, <clears throat> because when you're talking about most of the other distilled spirits out there, they have very specific rules as far as what can be this and what can be that. 
Um, and uh, vodka doesn't really have that. Uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's a distilled spirit that goes up to, uh, you know, you distill it up to 190, 190, 195 proof, uh, bring the proof back down with water and send it out the door. Now, the reason why uh, I think probably, and again, I don't know the full history of vodka in Russia, obviously, but it's, it's the easiest distilled spirit you can make. Cause you can make it with anything, you know, you can make it with potatoes, you can make it with corn, you can make it with, if you can, if you can ferment it and distill it, it can be vodka. Up next, we have pork chops with bourbon mushroom sauce. Does anyone here like bourbon uh, or mushroom? I, again, or it's one of those chops? things. In these, I'm finding these conversations we're mentioning things where all of the words are just words that I like to hear. Um, I feel like gravy is a word which is just pleasing to the ear. Like if somebody says, do you want gravy? You're like course i want gravy are you insane mushroom sauce sounds pretty good too yeah um yeah isn't is it does beef stroganoff have uh, any alcohol in it or is that i don't think it does no it has um, lots of other delicious is, things in it and i highly recommend it is a sauce. beef and mushroom combo though yeah beef and mushroom just seems to be a good combo um anything in mushroom seems to be a good combo but um no the uh and with this one uh there is uh, not only bourbon, but there is also white wine. So it's actually a, a double whammy on that one. And I like I said, I'll try that out. We'll be on the video. Hopefully you try them. I'm encouraging you to try these things and just try it. any recipe that you come across. Cook it. Just you're like, that sounds good. Then do it. Just do now, it. I have a question on that. So, no would you say, and my experience is when you're cooking with bourbon, um, you really don't have to get anything fancy because you're going to cook out most of the alcohol and most of the recipes. Um, and you can kind of get, uh, I mean, do you think it's okay to get a bottom shelf bourbon for your cooking or do you need, do you need something a little bit higher end? I would probably go at least mid shelf. So, like a Jim Beam or something because. like that? Yeah, Jim Beam uh, or something of that grade or higher for any of your cooking, uh, simply because there's a chemical reaction too. So cheap whiskey is not going to react as well with the product that you are cooking, as well as you know a higher grade whiskey, which is going to have a much better better chemical response to whatever you're making beef pork chicken vegetables anything like that uh because i know like there's brandy glazed carrots and stuff like that um the higher the quality of the product and the higher quality of the liquor product that you're using you're going to end up with a better end result um and it's i know that sounds a little bougie but that's why you pay a hundred and whatever dollars at some high-end restaurant for one thing does the uh table pairing kind of mirror the cooking pairing like if you do white wine with chicken or seafood or something does white wine go best in the cooking with it um yeah basically uh, your your white wines and your red wines that is a debate that has gone on for years um if you, if you're having chicken or fish it would be perfectly fine to have a blush. You could totally have a blush. Um, I probably wouldn't go full red though, because it would clash a bit. Because you're thinking when you're doing fish, chicken, things like that, you're getting a lot of citrus. It's uh, a lot of acid-based flavors. Um, it's going to mess with the acids in those redder wines. Uh, it's gonna throw off the tannins and everything in there. It's just gonna not work. Um, so you don't want to just duct tape something on. So it's, you wouldn't then try and cook, say, shrimp in a red wine. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. But uh, your, your recipe has to be specifically designed for that flavor profile, for the reactions that are going to happen in that pan. Like uh, you can do chicken or shrimp in a, or I probably wouldn't do fish, but you could do chicken and shrimp in, in a red sauce, in, in a red wine sauce. Um, you just got to make sure that all your flavors are going to meld with that. 
You don't want to add any kind of vinegars, any extra acids, anything like that. Hmm. Um, so what do you say we move on to something else? Here's one for, uh, I want to say that I've noticed in the chats on the uh, videos that we have put out, there have been a request for some more uh, champagne cocktails more champagne recipes. So I went out and I found one and there's actually a whole YouTube video for it that I'm gonna link to in this, uh, chicken and champagne sauce. And it's actually a double whammy because not only is it champagne sauce, it has cognac and you get to do a flambe, which is always fun for in, in, uh, enjoying and uh, entertaining your friends. So, Could you explain what, how that works? Well, uh, in the flambe, in the flambe, you'll at some point in your cooking, you're going to have sauteed your chicken. You're going to split the breasts and pound them out, and then you're going to saute them in your sauce. You're going to have a few other things going on in there, and then right at the right moment, you're going to add some cognac, and the cognac is going to sit in there. It's going to start bubbling instantly. It's going to start simmering instantly. And you're going to let that just kind of swirl around two, three times. And then you're going to tip your pan and get some flame on there. Because as you mentioned before, you're actually cooking out most of the alcohol. What you're really after is the flavor. You're getting rid of the alcohol. You're getting rid of the water. You're just trying to condense all those flavors down. And when you're using champagne, cognac, uh, bourbon, uh, brandy, anything vodka anything you're just trying to condense those flavors down and concentrate that into the food that you're making um but a flambe is always fun to do you get a tan the pan a little flip get a little uh little flame on there you'll see it it'll go up it'll go up like right now you'll know what it's happening and then you just gotta swirl it out just gotta swirl it out we should say when you're doing anything with fire around alcohol just be very careful because burns Thanks happen. You. Yes. You so, want to make um, sure you have plenty of alcohol in your system first. <laughs> uh, ELI five, or just explain like I'm five. If you're getting ready to add your alcohol to the recipe, are you doing it at the point? Let's see. After bringing it to boil, you bring it down to simmer. Would it be at the simmer point where things are starting to thicken up? Well, yeah, in this case, you're using it in a in more of a braising action as opposed to in your in, as a sauce on, on now, the flambe. Is, yeah, but on, on yeah. like the other recipes, any of the other recipes, you never really want to get above a simmer. If, if you're going above a simmer, you are hurting that sauce and you're doing damage to it. You're changing the flavor profile. You're changing the texture of it. Um, like Mike said earlier about curdling, everything, you just want to keep it nice and easy. Just bring it up nice and easy. That's your little baby. You just want to raise that little baby up. Just get it where it needs to be. You don't want to rush it. Come on, go. Come on, go. No, that's not going to work out very well. Um, I've had that. I tried that with a couple of cheese sauces. Did not work out in my favor. Not at all. And one of them had... A whole bunch of really expensive white wine in it, and people were upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, did you want to hear any more? Let's see. Sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly. So the cognac, uh, we're kind of going through some of these, and maybe I'll just bring up real quickly. Cognac and brandy are basically the same thing. Um, if you're doing a recipe and it calls for cognac, and all you have is brandy. I won't tell anybody. It'll probably be fine with regular brandy, um, but don't don't tell uh, don't tell any of the the high fluting chefs that you used it because they'll probably look down on you. Um, but brandy, in most cases, is gonna is gonna substitute for cognac just fine. Uh, I mean, there's lots of cocktails in which I've gone the other way because I usually don't I don't keep brandy around, but I do keep a couple of bottles of cognac around for for some cocktails like sidecar. Um, and so I put cognac in for brandy. You could put brandy in for cognac. It's it's fine. 
every time someone says cognac, I think about that guy Pinky in that Friday movie. Was it? You made me spill my yak. Don't make me spill my yak. <laughs> and it's pink limousine. That's awesome. Um, no, but speaking of brandy, how about pork medallions in brandy cream sauce? More words I like. I'm fans of those words. Cream, Sounds brandy. Pretty good. If you're going to need a pork loin. Sauce. I like loins. <laughs> um, now, that's one of those, too. I always think of pork loins going into the crock pot. Most of my pork loins either go in the oven or in the smoker. I don't do much else with them. Um, if you're going to do a chop, you want to bone in and boneless chops, butterfly chops. That's just pork loin. That's just pork loin. That's all it is. Um, so, but then I don't have anything against that because, well, pork is good. And I know pigs a filthy animal, but pork is good. Sorry. It just is. I think bacon uh, would be, if I ever decided to go vegetarian, I think bacon would be the toughest thing to give up. It's so good. I'm not a huge fan of bacon, honestly. Okay, we're going to end the show right here. <laughs> I will say one controversial thing uh, about bacon, and this is something, I, I'm, I'll be interested to see what you guys think about this. There, there was this real big thing for a long time where everybody wanted their big, super thick sliced bacon. And I kind of like thin sliced bacon. Is that weird? That is weird. You should end the show now. Like thin, it's like it's like crispier. It's it's just yummier. I don't know. I feel like like some people have the bacon. It's cut like this, and it's like it's like almost a pork chop. Like it's it's huge. And uh, I, I don't like, know. I like peppered, thick cut bacon, and I think that's well, about as the least experienced cooking person on this show. Thick cut for me works out good because the way I do it, it it comes down to about a, the size I wanted anyway. If I do thin cut bacon, it's barely going to be crumbs by the time I'm done. Because Okay. Are you okay, a burner? Here. Do you burn your bacon? This is the question. I try and is burn it, most of my meat. Oh, my God. Are, there's three levels of bacon. There's not quite done. There's perfectly done and crispy critters. Which one are you? I like the crispy critter ones. I'm sort of... Like I, I think I'm weird in that I kind of... like. So I used to burn it a little bit. I didn't mind like a little bit of char on there, um, but not hopefully not too much. But now I'm kind of at the other end where I kind of like it maybe a little bit underdone. Well, it depends. I mean, I, I'm kind of straightforward on all of them, but like uh, like we had um, some brats on the grill today and burned brats, but like charred on the outside. That's really good. I feel like, yeah. Well, anything with a little bit of char on it, just a little bit of char. On any meat product or or, really or marshmallows any, for s'mores those can be totally burnt too or like roasting some uh, bell peppers oh yeah or roasting some uh, habaneros burn a few cor- kernels on a corn or some poblanos <laughs> any in the pepper onion. family i would go with poblanos just because i like that smoky flavor um habanero you gotta be kind of careful with because habaneros we've actually got some chocolate habaneros uh that are going to be picked very very soon and i'm going to make a uh a brown uh, habanero sauce which is going to or uh, yeah a uh, hot sauce which is going to be pretty interesting and i think we got some carolina reapers and we got a couple of jamaican yellows too so we, we'll, we'll maybe someday we'll do a show on peppers <laughs> i got some garden fresh habaneros today so uh by the way we'll not to be that guy but it's habanero it's not an enya. It's jalapeno has an enya, but habanero doesn't. So it's just habanero. You say it how you want to say it. I'll say it how I want to fucking say it. Shut the fuck up. Don't I say me. potato. You say it wrong. <laughs> um, let's see. I want to throw a couple more recipes out here. Um, there was a couple that I came across on Eat This. And uh, let's see. There was a melon ball salad with triple sec vodka and pineapple juice. It had uh, musk melon, honeydew, and something else. I can't remember what it was. That might be the first one I'm kind of out on. I've never understood musk melon. Really? Yeah. I don't know yeah. if I've ever had it. I don't know if I can still be your friend. <laughs> okay. 
Um, no, I love muskmelon. Muskmelon's awesome. Or cantaloupe. Yeah. Um, triple seg is great. I just don't, don't know. It. Uh, triple seg is going to bring the orange flavor. Um, if you want to be bougie, you could use uh, Cointreau. Uh, Cointreau would be very good in that. The only thing with, with regular triple sec, especially if you get your low-end triple sec, is going to be kind of um, – it's going to have some artificial sweetness to it. So if you've got the money to toss some Cointreau in there, you might, it, it, that might work out a little bit better, but I feel like this is a good time to bring up the fact that a recipe is the baseline. That's the baseline of what's going on. And what you just said is perfect. Triple sec. It's cheap. It's not that great. Cointreau would be better. I would use Cointreau if it was me. Um, so like any recipe you come across, if, if you see something that interests you, you think, oh, that, that sounds good, but I would do this, then do that. Or if you're feeling super bougie, you could use some Grand Marnier, except that's, I don't know who's using Grand Marnier in their, in their cooking. That stuff gets pretty expensive. I, I would, I would do that. Oh, I'm not saying it wouldn't be good. It'd be be very good. Uh, The difference, by the way, we, uh, and one time Brandon came down, we sort of were were messing around with the the orange liqueurs and we went to Cointreau versus Grand Marnier. Um, And this would be my guide. If you're using it in a cocktail, typically I would probably use Cointreau because Cointreau is a very pure kind of uh, unsweet uh, orange flavored liqueur. Whereas Grand Marnier is, I believe comes from Cognac. Um, so it is a, it is sort of an orange ish flavored cognac. Uh, so if you were sipping and not putting in a cocktail, I would definitely go for Grand Marnier over Cointreau. I used to do that actually. I used to just sit there and sip my Grand Marnier at the end of the shift. Nothing wrong with that. Um, another one. Here's one for you guys. You might enjoy this Mezcal's Gaspacho. Interesting. That. Looked very good. Um, now, like gazpacho said, is cold, be... right? Yeah. So, yeah. Does, where do we all know gazpacho the... soup from first? Red Dwarf. It's Red Dwarf. Does does the does the alcohol cook off then? Um, well, in in any of these dishes, um, you're going to cook off probably ninety percent of the alcohol. So the mezcal is bringing. Uh, I'm assuming they're using mezcal because it's bringing that kind of smoky flavor that mezcal brings. Yes, I, I, I would agree to that. Um, and then let's see, a couple more that I'm just going to run off. Uh, coffee liquor, co- coffee liquor, whatever your favorite coffee liquor is. Or if you don't have one, just pick one. And then yogurt, and whichever is your favorite yogurt, if you don't have a favorite one, just pick one. And you can combine that into a delicious fruit dip. Or, you know, fresh bananas, strawberries, grapes, things like that. Um, like I said, all the recipes will be in these links. Um, the one only more one. One thing to note on uh, if you're making some of the coffee liqueur, be sure you try them out first. Like Kahlua, for example, is a good one, but it also has a lot of sweetness to it, too. It's again, one, one thing you're going to find um, when you're buying your, your mixers is uh, sweetener is, is sort of a cheap fill. So in other words, if you, if you get your, your, uh, uh, your Paramounts, your Dekuypers, there's going to be a lot of sweetness in there because it's an easy way to fill out the bottle because your, your distilled spirit is going to cost a lot more than your, your artificial sweeteners, like your, your, um, um, your high fructose corn syrup and things like that. So uh, go through some of them. One that's been suggested a lot, they're, it's, it's, they sponsor a lot of online content. They don't sponsor us, so you know, we're not getting any money from him, but a lot of people seem to like Mr. Black a lot and feel like that's a, sort of a less sweet uh, coffee liqueur. So that might be one to try. I have not tried it myself, so I'm not going to endorse or not endorse it, but it's one to look at maybe. Here's a, a little note since you bring up Kahlua. Tiramisu, you've probably heard of it. If you've been ever out to a restaurant, it has a dessert tray. Very good. Um, they put Kahlua on that. And uh, a little extra added bonus would be to put one more splash, one ounce splash of cognac on the actual piece that you're serving. Because uh, it does have fresh cacao on it, which is delicious, but it does need a little bit of sweetness to it. Actually, another um, one we talked about, uh, Grand Marnier, if you're having some kind of a chocolate dessert, 
uh, orange and, and chocolate go very well together. So you could, you could put a little Grand Marnier on there as well. Brandon, you're a fan of the orange and chocolate thing, right? Uh, I don't know how much I've actually had it. You used to get those chocolate orange things. I don't know. Uh, at least in my older age, orange is a problem for me. I, I don't do orange juice or anything. It really upsets my stomach. So, All right. Well, then here's one. Uh, coconut rum balls. That sounds really good. Yes, they are made with rum, which makes them awesome. I'm a big fan of coconut, too. And I'm a big fan of rum. <laughs> uh, and then they're actually uh, covered with uh, fresh cacao. So. Oh, one thing we you sort of talked about kind of briefly when you were talking about a flambe. Um, for alcohol to burn, people kind of probably assume that alcohol, you just you just set it on fire and it goes up real easily. But basically, you have to be, my understanding is that around 80 proof before it will even burn at all. Um, so yeah. most liqueurs, like you can't pour a liqueur on something and expect it to burn off. Um, if you are going to do something like that, one great thing to do is to keep a bottle of uh, 151 rum sitting around. Um, and use it just for that purpose because 151 rum will go up real quick. <laughs> um, and so oftentimes they use it in cocktails, but you could use it in cooking too. Um, if you want to just top something and, and sort of cook it off at, uh, you know, at the table or, or however you're doing it, uh, a 151 rum is great. Plus it brings great rum flavor and leaves that rum flavor as well. Well, I do like rum. I'm not a huge fan of 151 um well i mean remember you're gonna be burning off basically all the alcohol so it's not like the 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 proof is going to be staying there okay i i guess i can agree to that then um uh that's pretty much all i have right now uh the i just have a few uh finishing notes here um first of all when you are cooking uh just be creative make it your own just do your own thing. Um, you, the recipe there, like I said, is just the base. It's it's just there to get you started. The the real soul of the of the product, the real uh, creativity that comes out comes out of you, and you have to make it yours. Make it your own. Do it how you want to do it, and then hopefully people like it that way. And if they don't, then you can punch them in the face. No, I'm saying. <laughs> I think uh, I got to say for somebody who is just at the basic, my only real strong point is being able to follow a recipe. Well, my taste buds are shit. So if I end up trying to make it salted or peppered to my flavor, it's not going to be to Andrea's flavor. Um, don't be afraid to just stick by the recipe until you get better at it. Develop your cooking skills, develop your taste bud. Yeah. Take if your you're time. Not with comfortable. That too. If, if you're not comfortable changing it at all, then don't change it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying and to also maybe people. don't experiment if you just bought really, really expensive meat from Whole Foods. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You're going to be real sad if that fair. experiment like, doesn't work out. <laughs> uh, no, no professional race car driver just jumped in a race car and suddenly became a race car driver. They had to learn how to do it. No carpenter ever became a great carpenter without learning how to do it. You know, it's kind of that thing. Um, I do have a couple of quick mentions, uh, YouTube videos, and I suppose we can put the links in here. Well, I can put one link in here because I haven't been able to find the other one. Uh, yeah, well, well, those, those, will episode, the, those will be in the, uh, in the, in the description below. So any of this stuff that you want, you want the recipes and all this other stuff, uh, it'll be in, uh, in the link below to, uh, to click. Um, and you know, if, uh, if they ask where you, who sent you there, then, you know, tell them it was intoxicated masculinity. Um, by the way, uh, another little update on that. There is a way, uh, one of the problems is being able to copy a non YouTube link or a non active link, um, out of the YouTube mobile app. So if, the recipe is there in full written down and you want to just copy it. You can go to your browser on your phone and switch it over to the desktop site and go to YouTube from there and full copy from YouTube there. Sounds good. I'm honestly way more 
on my phone than than on here. I'm really only on here for a few things and mostly on my phone. I think that's pretty uh, typical too. I think I think uh, especially younger people. <laughs> I sound like such an old man. The younger generation, uh, except it's not just the younger generation; it's it's our generation too. The millennials uh, are primarily online. But uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we got some great recipes, and I think we're all a little bit hungrier than we were an hour ago. Um, I, Brent, do you have anything uh, you want to say in closing? Plug. Sorry, Gail, go ahead. What are you saying? No, go ahead. I got Evan. I am, like I said, I, I enjoy good food. I am not much of a cook. I don't enjoy it as much. I enjoy other people's cooking. Um, so I, it's great to hear. I enjoyed the conversation. All right. And uh, since Kale was sort of leading us and, and taking us through all this, let's give him the last word. I want everybody to like and subscribe. And Kale, what do you what do you have to close us out with? YouTube, no reservations, El Bully. And I have not been able to find a link for no reservations, the Spain episode. That is probably my favorite episode. Anthony Bourdain was one of my heroes. And as you may know, he went all Jim Morrison over in France in a hotel and um Bourdain was a rich man he was not rich just financially but I mean in life he went lots of places he knew lots of people he knew lots of things he enjoyed lots of things um just a really wonderful person to be around I would think and uh he killed himself he fucking killed himself and i think jim jeffries kind of summed it up when he was talking about it he said that you know i have everything you know i'm famous i'm rich i can do whatever i want and blah 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 but i'm still fucking depressed because you can't understand depression you can't but i think that's a subject for our mental health episode which is going to be coming up it's on the schedule and um, yeah and if, if you need help seek help um you know we'll put we'll put a we'll put a link to that below as well um yeah it's it's a shame he had a I lot more like, he had a lot more years left in him and a lot more things to do I but i think it does vision. it, it does sorry, go I, to just gonna... it does go to show that you know life is short and you should eat well and drink well All right. All right. Uh, once again, like, subscribe. We thank you for coming. And everybody have a good drink and have a good day.